very much and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packle and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from all around the world. And I just want to mention a couple things. First of all, you know, Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. Christos anesti, alithos anesti. For those from the Greek tradition, though the Greek Orthodox and the other Orthodox communities are still in Holy Week. They'll be celebrating Easter this coming week. But this is how in the Eastern Church throughout this week, because we celebrate Easter every day this week. It's a, the, the week of, of Easter. And it's typical in the Eastern Church to greet people with Christ is risen, indeed he is risen. At my parish, Messiah come, hakan come, you know, Christ, uh, in Arabic. And we all ought to have that sense of continuing to celebrate this great feast of Easter every day. That's why we have the, all the readings uh, this week of the gospel come from the resurrection. So that's important. Also want to mention that today is the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I uh, uh, did a lot of really fine work and you know, really sought to bring reconciliation and was an extremely important figure in our country at a time that was right to help bring about some of the social justice, much of which he did right here in Birmingham, Alabama, as well as Montgomery. So we remember him well and pray that there would be the kind of racial peace and justice that he called for. Well, tonight we have a guest, as usual on Wednesdays, and to many of you, she is known simply as the Purgatory Lady because she's written so many books about the subject of purgatory and praying for the holy souls. And I recommend those books all the time because they're good. But tonight she has a new thing. I don't know what they're going to call her after this. Uh, maybe she's gotten out of purgatory. She's going to be the Mercy Lady. I don't know. But at any rate, she's here with us tonight to share her new book about how St. Faustina Kowalska's wisdom and spiritual insight can help us to step away from the constant noisiness of the world and really connect with our Lord Jesus Christ through the peace and silence of adoration. So please welcome the author of the new book, St. Faustina Prayer Book for Adoration, Susan Tassoni. Susan, good to have you. Good to have you here. Always good to see you. Welcome down to Sweet Home Alabama from up in Sweet Home Chicago. It's snowy, chilly, and you yeah, have maybe flowers. not so sweet. Well, it looks like sugar <laughs> until it starts to melt, then it gets dirty. Happy Easter to you. <laughs> Happy Easter. It's, a, it's becoming a habit every year at the same time we get together. Yeah, so. right. Well, you and keep writing good books, and this uh, this new one I think is a, a very important one. I'd, I'd read it, yeah. you know, in the pre-publication form. And um, you have a lot of uh, important insights from St. Faustina to help people when they do Eucharistic adoration. First step, let's establish what is adoration, Eucharistic adoration of our blessed Lord. What does that mean? It, it, just put it simply, Father, you're adoring the body, blood, and soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. We, we receive him in communion, and then we adore him like it's a natural flow uh, in adoration. And adoring is, is gazing in faith mm -hmm. uh, in front of his presence. Um, it's, it's a very powerful form of prayer. Mm -hmm. I think it's a critical form of prayer uh, because, again, as you said, um, people are, in, there's so much noise, whether it's written, whether it's on TV or the Internet, and this gives you a chance to be with him. And he calls us to be with him. He told Margaret Mary, uh, St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, that his heart burns for love uh, for man to come and be with him in the Blessed Sacrament, to sit with him. Mm -hmm. And I, I think uh, this is something that's important. It, it deals with a human need that is not being met. 
the um, we have a very noise filled world uh, when you're in an elevator and so many other places. Uh, there, there's noise. It's it's not. We don't even call it music. We call it music. And there, there's also the yeah. noise around us of the you know vehicles and everything else happening, and th there's also the noise of just so much activity. There's a very I, I used this as a chapter in one of my my books earlier, um, and it's the principle that if the devil can't make you bad, he makes you busy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. too busy to pray, too busy to listen to God. Exactly, too busy to hear his voice. In fact, throughout the diary, she um, it was a common thing, a theme of hers uh, to be silent. And in fact, uh, Father Mitch, I think you probably noticed in, in the endorsements, uh, Archbishop uh, Baker, Archbishop Listecki, uh, Cardinal Sarah endorsed the book. Now, they didn't know what each other were writing. That was their favorite chapter because we had a chapter on um, silent adoration. Mm -hmm. And that's when you're, if you, he, he actually told Faustina that he can't get through a soul if he's not silent. You're not going to be able to hear him. Uh, and we had special, actually, um, some kind, we had uh, quotes of hers, Father, that what she said about, uh, what she said about silent adoration, about, about silence, I should say. She said that a silent soul is strong. No adversities will harm it if it perseveres in silence. Uh, she also said, my particular exam is still the same, namely union with the merciful Christ and silence. And then again, she says, a silent soul um, is capable of attaining the closest union with God. It lives almost under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God works in a silent soul without hindrance. And, but one of the other things, too, about the silence is just it's not only an absence of the noise. The silence in Eucharistic adoration is for the presence of God so that our Lord Jesus is present in the Blessed Sacrament. And I think an, uh, one of the, the, the common teachings since the Vatican Council is that we have uh, Eucharistic adoration and benediction of the Blessed Sacrament are both portrayed in the post-conciliar documents as an extension of Mass. At right. Mass, it's oftentimes not quiet. You know, the community is gathered. Mm -hmm. But the time for silence in benediction and in adoration, that's where we also are silent with Jesus. Correct, Father. You know, um, if you think about it, Father, what does Pope Francis, uh, St. John Paul II, Mother Angelica, St. Teresa, and Faustina have in common? What do they have in common? they did adoration and they adored. It was a very important part of their spiritual life. And what did it do to them? It transformed them um, uh, themselves and it transformed, it changed the world. Take Pope Francis. I was doing some research, Father, and five years he's been our Pope. And what I discovered is he was constantly talking about adoration. He brings it up many times. And in fact, uh, last this in March, we're in March, I think, no, we're in April, um, he wanted every church, uh, a, a church in every diocese to have 24 hours with the Lord uh, so they could walk in and be in his presence. And he also uh, in, encouraged uh, confession at the same time. Uh, he, he also, this was very interesting, in February, he spoke to um, newly installed pastors in Rome and said that we teach the people how to sing, we teach them how to pray, but we don't teach them how to adore. He said, teach them how to adore in silence. Mm -hmm. And then, then we have uh, St. John Paul II. And he had, actually, Father, he had a desk and chair in the chapel when he was writing his encyclicals. That's right. Yeah, I, I, that was pretty fascinating to, to, to realize that. And he said that, um, we need Eucharistic adoration. The church needs it and the world needs it because, because of the crimes that are committed in the world and we need to make reparation. And he said, we need to adore, um, we need to never stop adoring. 
And then we have Mother Angelica. Mother Angelica, the, she was a, a sister of perpetual adoration. Her order was, Claire was the, was the one of the what, 13th century uh, saint that was a devotee of, of, of praying in the presence. And um, this was interesting. When Mother Angelica, what was the fruit of her, of her, of her adoration? This, this network, mm -hmm. this global network, um, and, and I, if you don't make me sidebar, and I just have to share this, Father. Uh, you and I are here. This is what amazes me. I was 23 about a couple of days ago, and and you turned 23 I turned a, French, couple days. a couple of days ago. <laughs> and pretty young, isn't it, Father? Yes. Um, I look young, and and I met you at Loyola. We, we went to Loyola. Our poor ramblers uh, didn't make it, but they they. They did a good run, and I was working in the sociology department, and you were a scholastic. You were telling me, yes, and I and I met you. Our, you know, this was what back in the seventies. Yeah, about seventy-five. Yeah, seventy-five, mm -hmm. and I actually worked for your uh, father Gannon, who was the he was the, of, the director of for studies, the director yes. of studies, and I was the department secretary. So I had a big filing cabinet. So part of my job was to take care of the scholastics. So there's all these names, Father. Your name was in that file, Mitch Paco. You know, and I would file things. It's a and big I, file, uh, actually. No, Father. Guess what was in the file? What? Nothing. <laughs> oh, well, it's big you, now. You were you were pretty <laughs> you were pretty clean, Father. I think you're more interesting now. Um, but but I just think it was fascinating because of Mother Angelica and because of uh, you know her her adoring and the fruit of her adoration. We look at this. Here we are. I never thought I'd meet the mind of twelve professors, you know, on a, on a EW10 Global Catholic Network. That's the power of adoration. Yeah. And then you have Mother Teresa, Father. Mm -hmm. You have Saint Mother Teresa. And what I learned about her, she um, she started to do adoration once a week. Mm -hmm. And the reason was is there was she was vocations. They wanted to increase vocations, and so she started to do it once. Every day, every day she did uh, she did um, adoration with her sisters, and what happened was vocations doubled. And the other thing, what was interesting to note, that people, the secular media, would talk about how she took care of the poor and how she bandaged the sick. But one thing they never addressed, Father, they never addressed this vital act that she did of adoration on a daily basis. And she said that if she didn't do adoration, she would probably be burnt out. Yeah. Um, and then, then we have Faustina. Faustina. Um, maybe you could say this in Polish. Um, she, uh, she, uh, her life was adoration. In fact, her name was Saint Faustina of the Blessed Sacrament, mm -hmm. and most people did not know that. Um, and there's a saying, and you could say this in Polish: "You become the one you befriend." Mm -hmm. She became the one she befriended. She wanted to be the living host. She she calls herself. Jesus is the big H. And she was the little host. She wanted to honor him through who he was, and she wanted to become the one she befriended, and she did. And that's what adoration is: you become the one you befriend, you become the compassion, you become. Uh, but Mother Teresa, Pope John Paul, Pope Francis, become the one they befriend. Yeah, you know, I know that Mother Angelica used to spend two hours in adoration for every hour she was on TV. And she, she, she made sure that she was praying more. And she got up pretty early to get up and, and do that adoration and prayer. Archbishop Sheen was the same way. He also did adoration. That there, and a lot of folks, I think, are afraid. Well, I don't have time. And one of the great, I love the line by, um, uh, Saint, uh, oh, he, he was the, uh, a bishop down in Geneva, but um, yeah, Francis de Sales. Uh, Saint Francis de Sales was told by the mayor, uh, "Your you know, Excellency, I have to do this. I'm the mayor. I have all these things." And his response was, "Somebody as busy as you needs to spend two hours a day in adoration." And you know, one of the miracles that happens when we do daily adoration is that our Lord does a multiplication yes. of the minutes. Yes, yes. That, you know, when instead of loaves and fish, as we spend more time in prayer, we get more done otherwise 
because we're with him. Father, that's act true. It's proven. I've done it. Mm -hmm. And if I pray and do the rosary, adoration, go to mass, then my work becomes more efficient. Yep. And, and you get as much work, if not more done. In fact, this other point about Mother Angelica, Father, um, when things got rough um, and she had many challenges, you know what St. John Paul did? And I watched on TV, he sent her this ginormous, beautiful, spectacular monstrance right. from Poland. And the point was, is keep your eyes focused on Jesus and, and stay focused on him and all will be well. Don't lose sight of him. And I think th her order, uh, part of their prayer of adoration is Thanksgiving. So she adored and she gave Thanksgiving. But I like this idea that two hours more of adoration for every hour of the television programming she did. Mm -hmm. And of course, there, there are adaptations that if you have young children, you can't sort of, don't wet yourself, don't get hungry, and don't cry, I'm going to go pray. No, you can't do yeah, that with no, infants. Duty first. But, yeah. but there, you know, there are seasons of life and states of life where it is more feasible and it's better to spend more time in adoration with our Lord than in watching other networks where a lot of the nonsense that is put on TV is merely a noisy distraction. If you want truth, you'll get truth in adoration. But that's one of the other things, though, that people fear is they're afraid if they are silent and they listen, maybe God will speak and that scares them. And that's one of the reasons some people try to avoid it. They don't want God to shake up the stasis of their lives. They, they I'm, I'm okay, don't, don't ask me to do anything. Um, and our Lord can be fairly pushy. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, that's one of the other things about actually hearing from God in prayer. Go ahead. You talked about, um, about time, and um, that's one interesting thing that I noticed in her diary, uh, Father, that she... Yeah, but you mean St. Faustina. Yeah, St. Faustina's yes. diary, that she adored for an hour on Thursdays. But for, for the most part, because I, you know, I worked several months on, with her diary, she really didn't do hours except that one week, she did moments, she did minutes, she did five minutes, and she did 10 minutes of adoration. Mm -hmm. So when I read that, I was kind of relieved because you feel obligated that if you want to do adoration, it has to be just for that hour or it has to be a whole hour, and that's not the case at all. Mm -hmm. um, it basically freed me up to say that you could, she passed by the chapel and just bowed. I know many of the employees here pass by the doors um, of the chapel here and just nod to our Lord. Mm -hmm. Five minutes with our Lord, 10 minutes with our Lord. He wants that. It doesn't have to be a whole hour. So it gives you that freedom and uh, to be able to do that. And she did that, Father, tremendous amount of time. Um, so moments and minutes we have in, in, our, in our book and we actually listed the kinds of things that she said to him. Jesus, save me. Jesus, have mercy on me. Uh, be my light, O living host. Just, just walking, you, know, you could do it past a church. It, it, it just lets you know that adoration is not just fixed for an hour. Yeah, and you know, I myself, even when I'm driving, even if I'm on the expressway in Chicago, that's very easy because there's so many old churches that they had to redirect the expressways around. Uh, but I cannot pass a Catholic church without crossing myself. I know that Christ is present in that church. I can't pass it by without uh, that awareness of his presence there and just crossing myself and letting the presence of Christ in that church sanctify the whole area. Right, that was another thing that just really touched me. She, like we're sitting here, she really, she believed with all her heart, all her soul, it tru he's truly there, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And she went to him and she brought 
her troubles to him. She brought her weaknesses to him. She asked for healing. She asked for intercession. Um, everything was was for the Lord. All her all her thoughts, her desires was to him that he truly was there and he truly did help her and she truly did abandon herself to him. And that really moved me. And so what I was trying to do was absorb this and then go to adoration and see if mm -hmm. I had a different feeling. Sure enough, Father, when I went one day, and it's right on, on LaSalle Street Catholic Charities, I'm, mm -hmm. you're familiar with that building, and um, there's a chapel and I sat there and I, I looked at him and I, after reading her, I went, you really are here. This is you truly, and it, your whole mindset, it, mind changed. And I said, well, while you're here, I got a couple of things to tell you, you know. Yeah. Um, and, but he wants you to share. He wants you to, um, he wants, just what Faustina wanted, she wanted to become the one um, she befriended. She wanted to be like him. And he was, she basically, um, she just poured her heart out to him. And she, you know, she immersed herself in the fire of his love and in the ocean of her mercy. And she was able then, she was transformed, Father, mm -hmm. um, and she was empowered then to go back out and to be compassionate and to be loving. And, um, you know, he actually was her teacher. I've experienced that myself when I'm, you know, you're struggling and you, you can just sit there and you can get this light. But he taught her not to hold grudges. He taught her how to forgive. Um, he, he taught her, uh, you know, to, to be at peace and, and not to worry, uh, you know, have faith and have trust. Uh, and that's, and then she, beca she became that living host. And that's what we're called to do. We're, be we're called to be who he wants us to be, who we're, he, he made us for a specific mission. He made us for a certain time in this world that no one has, this one mission nobody has, but, but you, you have a special mission, Father, that no one has or will ever have. And he wants us to fulfill that mission. He wants us to be the one he made us to be. And that's what happened to her in adoration. And I think as we consider this, we ought to remember the era of her life. She's receiving these different messages from our Lord. She's growing in prayer. It's, that's one of the things I love about her diary is that there is true development. It starts off kind of, you know, syrupy, kind of superficial. But the farther you mm -hmm. go into it, the deeper it becomes because Christ really is giving her depth. And this is through the 1920s and into the 1930s. She died in 1938, mm -hmm. uh, I think, what, October of 1938. October um, and think about that era. This is the time when the communists took over Russia and turned it into the Soviet Union. They invaded Poland uh, at least once in 1921, I think it was. They uh, later on, the Nazis in, invaded uh, within 11 months of her death. And but the but the uh, Third Reich was in full swing already, annexing different countries like Austria and Czechoslovakia. And you, you see the rise of absolutely merciless mm -hmm. atheistic communism. And the atheists are the most merciless people in history. It's it, 305 million people died in just in the wars and persecutions. And that mercilessness was about to run absolutely rampant. And she is with Christ learning about his mercy so she can teach it to us in the aftermath of the mercilessness. She became the image of divine mercy, Father. Yep. Yeah. Yep. She, yep. she became, you know, his passion. She became his, um, he, he was able to transform her to become uh, compassion and overwhelming concern for others. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we're called to be. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I think it's important that this Eucharistic adoration had um, a tremendous impact on someone who became something of her great apostle, 
namely Pope St. John Paul. Yes, yeah. I don't know if you knew this, but you know he was do, he had to do forced labor for the Nazis yes, right. at a quarry, a stone quarry. Not too far away from where she was. Well, yeah. it's uh, her grave overlooked the quarry. Oh. There's just a railroad track that separates, and I've been there. And just across the railroad tracks from the little knoll where she was buried is the Sovine quarry. And it was as if she was overlooking him. Yeah, yeah. And then in that period, he would stop by. The Nazis had closed down the churches in Krakow, but not the convent church. And he'd go there for adoration on the way home for work, a visit. Mm -hmm. And this was part of his daily routine. So what she did, he then joined in. Mm -hmm. and we see the impact. We have on him in our book because that was part of his pontificate. Divine yep. Mercy was a was a major part of his po pontificate. Um, you know, she's she's really she's going to be a doctor of the church, uh, Father. So it's just an, it was an honor. I have to say this, Father. This is a trilogy we we did Saint Faustina Prayer Book for the Holy Souls last year. This very day we we had come out with Saint Faustina Prayer Book for the Conversion of Sinners. Mm -hmm. Father, that book has sold twelve thousand copies. Good. Um, it was because people There's didn't a know. There's few more sinners than that. We need <laughs> to get that out there more. Okay, I'll do my best. Yeah, yeah. And then th then we came out with adoration because that was one area in the diary that uh, Father Dan Cameron. Uh, shared with me that wasn't wasn't gleaned out. So I, I have to say this, Father. I've done eleven books. This was the most exquisite, the most powerful, the most touching book, one of the finest books I've done. I've been extremely moved by it, and I wish I could have one for every person in the world because the writings and the, the we have original prayers. Uh, it all tied in with adoration and the power of it. And we'll talk about the benefits and the consequences of it. Well, one of the most important things that you said to me earlier, uh, I think it was last night at dinner, is that um, you bring this book with you to your holy hour because you want to go back to, to remind yourself and meditate on the things St. Faustina had said. I, yes. And that's still, it, it's not just, yeah, I crank out these books and get them out. And, uh, no, this is still this, a source of meditation It had you. such an impact on me, Father. I, uh, I had to give a talk for the first time. I got choked up talking about about this and she how, how she adored and who she adored with and what they you know how our lady our lady uh, you know she said you have to to get close to to Jesus her son you have to get close to our lady mm -hmm. so we have a whole section there she had dark nights of the soul father I was finding it through the diary and thinking what what do you, there was just a lot of dark nights and I thought well what do we do with dark nights we have adoration for dark nights and so I'm reading I thought well She's in the dark night. How do you get out of the dark night? And she had acts of trust, um, beautiful prayers to help a person, you know, um, to, to pray and to uh, intercede, ask God for intercession. But the prayers were super, super powerful. Um, there's a one, one of the most unusual, unusual things that I found. And Father, you, I don't, you were up this, you weren't at the seminary at St. Mundelein, were you? No. no you, were, you were studying uh, Down in the, Chicago, in the, in the, the, near University of Chicago. Okay, near there. But I was there at the seminary, and they had shelves of adoration books that were fantastic. But nothing on the eyes of Faustina. And there was one thing that jumped out, Father, at me that I didn't see anywhere else. What do you do if you can't go to adoration? And I was worried because I know we were going to meet down the road, and I thought, so I went to Faustina, and I, I you know, I, I sat before adoration. I go, well, what do you do if, you know, we've got people that are homebound, we have people that have children, we have people that have responsibilities, we have people where there's no adoration. How do you, you know, capture those people? Right. Guess what? You know, and I'm pouring through the diary, and I, you know, I did pray to her, and I did talk to her every day. Um, we have a relic at the cathedral right next to the monster, and so I. I met the pair every day and I said, I'm stuck. How do you handle this? Yeah. Father, in the diary, you can probably pass right over it. She took what they called spiritual flights, 
when when she many times she she was very frail. Her health was mm -hmm. you know kept her frail uh, and fragile. And so many times she was in her room. And so what she did and she called it spiritual flights. She took mental flights to the chapel toward the direction of where the chapel was, mm -hmm. and she prayed uh, toward him. Then I find out that. Padre Pio, St. Stanislaus Casca, um, Blessed Alexandra Costa, uh, many saints did this. In fact, some of the saints um, actually would, would request a cell, their room, that would face the chapel so they could adore, um, uh, you know, a, a spiritual adoration if they couldn't get to a, 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 a church sure, and adore. Sure. So this spiritual adoration answered the question for those that are unable uh, to adore. Exactly. You could have your own adoration chapel at home. Exactly. And that's, you know, it's sometimes even when we show, uh, the, we of course broadcast the Mass every day, you can sort of imagine yourself being there with us. And uh, also when we have benediction and such, we want that so that you can pray with us as well. We have to take a break. We want to come back for your questions and comments, as well as those of our studio audience. So please stay with us. First of all, before we start with our questions, want to give you a save the date uh, because we are going to have another EWTN family celebration. This next one will be in on November 3rd. Now it is going to be in beautiful, sunny Jacksonville, Florida. Great town, I, I love that city. And you can join us for this free event. It will be at the Prime Osborne Convention Center, Prime Osborne Convention Center. It's a one day only event on November 3rd and good a price, it's free. So you can go to EWTN.com slash family celebration. We'd love, it's a great chance for us to get uh, all over there. All right, you ready for some questions? All right, let's start off with a caller. Hello, caller? Hi. Hi, where Mitch, are you from? Father Mitch? Yes. Hi, Father Chris Alar. Greetings from the National Shrine of Divine Mercy. Oh, good. How are you doing, Father? Good to see you. Very good. And I just wanted to call and say hello to Susan. She's a wonderful friend of our community, our Marian fathers. But, Susan, I have a question. I, I got my MBA at Michigan, and we're the ones who beat your Ramblers <laughs> in the basketball tournament. Now, am I going to have to spend any extra time? in purgatory. <laughs> I don't know Father Alar, I'm sure there'll be no time in purgatory. You may have to deal with me <laughs> next time you're down here. That's another issue. <laughs> well, very good. I wanted to just quickly mention something, and we really enjoyed Susan's book and the importance of adoration, and I too was one of the ones that really liked the silence uh, chapter on silence. But I wanted to make one comment and question, if I may, and that is this, Susan. You know, we actually, we talk about noise, but, you know, we can be just as noisy in adoration. And that's what I love about your book, and that's what I love about that chapter. And I wanted to point out to the people was, you know, I learned in the Vishet how to slow that down because I used to race into the front of the Blessed Sacrament, and I had all these litanies to read and all these prayers to recite and all the you know, the prayers to, to vocally do, 
that I ended up doing all the talking. And so we can also be a little bit noisy in adoration if we're hurrying, talking too much. And that silence, as you mentioned in your chapter, is so beautiful. But even in adoration to not do all the talking, but to be silent as well. Yeah, I think I liked what uh, what um, Cardinal Sarah wrote about it. He said, silence is necessary for a true sacramental life. It leads to adoration, a personal encounter with the living God. Yeah. And, and I think the, uh, Father Alar has a, a very good point. Um, uh, I think it was somebody from Villanova who said this. <laughs> Sorry, Father. I got that. Uh, uh, but it was... Um, uh, that a lot of times people will be reading so many different books and I have, to, well, I have to go through these prayers and I got to read all these prayers and this one person told me I got to read all these and you don't listen to what Christ is saying to you. That is extremely important. Uh, that's why I wrote a book called How to Listen When God is Speaking. We need to learn that too. I just read that book. That was the one on discernment, Father. That yes, I just read. Yes. I just read that book about okay. a few days ago, and it's very good. I, good, I, I recommend good. you have the Purgatory Lady seal of approval for that book. <laughs> good. <laughs> Hopefully, it'll help me get out of Purgatory, <laughs> ma'am. Where are you from? I live in Birmingham. Welcome. My and what is and I your live question? In Birmingham, and I'm a member of the Valley of the uh, Lady of the Valley Church. My question to your lovely guest, and I enjoy her enthusiasm. And I always enjoy your programs. They're so informative. Thank My question is, what suggestions could you share with us so that we can interest and motivate and encourage our younger generation to want to pray in front of the Blessed Sacrament? There's so much ample opportunity. Churches have 40 devotions here in Alabama. They have uh, weekly, daily, uh, maybe holy hours. What would you say to us that we can say to them? Because they will be married someday and have a family. And they can pass this on to them. First, I think, Father, it would start when they were when they're young. Mm -hmm. uh, it starts in the family. It begins with the parents uh, taking them uh, to church, uh, and bringing them to adoration. Mm -hmm. I mean, they might be little tykes, but five minutes um, in, in adoration isn't going to make a lot of noise. Um, but I think that's where we begin is, mm -hmm. is at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a, a very important thing. And also, um, there was. Uh, a movement that was that started in Dallas back in the 1990s when I was still living there. I think it was called Youth 2000. Oh yes, right. Remember oh, that? Yes, I do. Yeah. And that movement was very powerful because it brought young uh, uh, high school and college students uh, for a retreat, a weekend retreat that focused on adoration and confession. And they had done that very well. I know at Steubenville, you, you go there and some of the other Catholic colleges, that you go to the Eucharistic Chapel and there's people there all the time. And there, a lot of young people do try to distract themselves with their computer, oftentimes looking at things that are not good for them at all, that are addictive even. And you also have uh, a lot of other problems. But this is a way to let them enter into being with Christ alone. Uh, I've seen it not only work with young people as some just being there with Jesus and ta learning to talk to him, but also a friend of mine in Atlanta who was himself a drug addict, and now he does a lot of work with drug addicts. He doesn't say, oh yeah, you got to go to confession and then come to Mass. No, he takes him to the Blessed Sacrament mm -hmm. Chapel at the cathedral in downtown Berm uh, Atlanta, and he just sits with them. And he sits with them, like you said. Mm -hmm. Parents need to do with their children. Mm -hmm. He sits with the, with the drug addicts. And, spends time, and then let's Jesus convert them. And that's one of the key things. We have something uh, in Chicago that pretty often that comes to the cathedral called night fever. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of that, Father? No. Yeah, it's a, it's a you know, um, adoration uh, from early evening until uh, midnight mm -hmm. um, for young people. I, I like the title of it, yeah, uh, yeah. Night yeah, Fever. Yeah, yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, 
Where are you from? I'm from Chicago. I'm Jean Studer, a suburb of Chicago. Okay. And I have two questions. I have one for Susan. I'd like to know what she learned from the book she wrote. And Father, I'd like to know the origins of adoration and Corpus Christi, Corpus Christi Sunday. Sure. Okay, this, this was profound, what I learned. I learned there were three things that, uh, that, that really stood out, um, and it's throughout the book, that adoration has intercessory power, Father. Mm -hmm. um, she uh, prayed on Thursdays, and she prayed for um, specific groups, uh, special attentions, and that really moved me, and I wanted to, I wanted to capture that. Um, she, she prayed uh, for her sister, Wanda, she had a sister named Wanda, mm -hmm. and Wanda was uh, meeting with her, and Wanda went off the deep end. She was telling her, telling Faustina her plans, and Faustina was beside herself because it was going in the wrong direction. So what she did was, is she pray, she 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 went to adoration, and she interceded for her. And in adoration, she would pray the rosary, she would do the chaplet. Of course, she would receive communion. Um, she made novenas, but but she was constantly before our Lord. And this was what she said, nudging him, you know, nudging him to help, uh, help, help her sister Wanda. And she said that we should nudge God and we should, you know, push him and, and you know, constantly be persistent in interceding for our loved ones. And that's what she did for Wanda. And Wanda turned around. There's also a consequence um, that I read about for, in adoration. The consequence was she was uh, adoring and the demons appeared to her and they were furious and they wanted to quote tear her to pieces mm -hmm. because she was interceding for the conversion of sinners and it snatched souls from heaven that's how powerful adoration is the the intercessory power that we have and she had several other groups she prayed for her country she prayed for the sick and the suffering she prayed for the souls in purgatory mm -hmm. um, so intercessory power is is was one of the big things that jumped out at me. The second is that you're not alone. You're not alone in adoration. You're praying with the angels. You're praying with Our Lady. You're praying with the saints. You're praying with the souls in purgatory. Mm -hmm. um, and that you're, you're, Faustina united her prayers with them th th because they were the ones that adored in a perfect way. Mm -hmm. And then third, I, I, I discovered that Jesus calls us to him. He calls us to him, and, uh, and so she, she, she mentions that, that there was a time when she forgot her hour, and he appeared to her and said, where were you? Um, and so, so he calls us to him, because why? Because he created us. He created us for him. He could have, he could have had a, you know, a million different Mitch, Father Mitch Pacwas, but he created you, Father Mitch, and he created us to be with him for all eternity. There could have been a gazillion more souls, but he chose you and he chose me. And he had a conversation with her one time and he said, uh, she, she said to him, you know, I, I was thinking about you. And he says, and I was thinking about you. And she said to Jesus, well, what were you thinking about? He says, I was thinking about how are you going to be with me for all eternity? Mm -hmm. the, the, that was another thing, the love that he has for us. Um, mm -hmm. So those were the three uh, key things that jumped out at me. Okay. And to answer the other question about uh, when adoration, benediction, and uh, Corpus Christi got started, it was in reaction to a heresy taught by a deacon from France named Berengar or Berengarius in Latin in the 1050s. He was the first theologian to ever deny the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And uh, eventually, uh, during, uh, w w during the debate, uh, a French priest came up with the term transubstantiation as a way to respond to him. He understood it then. He accepted the Catholic faith and came back. But in response, because it did get a, cause a stir, that Eucharistic adoration was the antidote to his heresy. Father, was there, was there, um, did something happen in Spain too? I read something about um, how adoration, something came out of some cathedral in Spain Could where be. there was portable tabernacles and the yeah. reason they were, uh, they, part of the, they, the, the monks would um, process to the dying and mm -hmm. that was part of that beginning of, of, of adoration. Uh, yeah, I don't, that part I don't know. Okay. All right, we have Paul McKibben on. Hello, Paul. 
Yes, hello, uh, Father. Hello, uh, Sue, uh, uh, Susan. It's, it's good to be with you tonight. You're, um, now, you're the editor of uh, Catholic Digest. Yes, I am, sir. Yes. And you put <laughs> and Susan on the cover. <laughs> yes, uh, she was on our November 2017 uh, was she, cover. Was she wanted for something? <laughs> In Chicago, <laughs> that's usually the reason. No, uh, she. We did. We did a wonderful um, interview with her about oh. uh, the very about uh, purgatory and what you're talking about uh, 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 tonight. And uh, she, uh, uh, it was a wonderful story that 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 we had. You, and you can find that on our website on uh, CatholicDigest.com. Oh, great! Well, that congratulations, Susan. Well, that's good, and and I, I'm sure that uh, that was a good article, making known a lot of the work that you're doing. Well, there's more news, Father. Yes, Paul, is he there? The on our June uh, 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 our June uh, cover. You're gonna. She'll be yeah. on that too. No. No. No, you are. You are. I am. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> now what am I wanted for? Yeah. Now what did I do this time, Lucy? At, at, the, uh, at, the, at the net network has not told you that, right? No. No, <laughs> no I had no idea. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, now yeah. I feel like you Ricky. Do, you did an uh, interview um, with one of our other uh, uh, writers about your book, Saved. Okay. All right. Um, you know, a Bible study guide for uh, Catholics. That's right, 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 right. Yeah. Be, yeah. Okay. Well, that's so, interesting. Uh, yeah. I'd, yeah. <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations, Father. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Thank you. I've never been uh, a cover photo on anything. Cover guy. Cover. Uh, please. The only pictures you, are at the post you know, office. You but could, that's something you could else. wallpaper your. You could wallpaper your living room with it now, Father. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. That, that's really an honor. Uh, shock, but an honor. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for calling. We appreciate that. Uh, we have a, another question from our studio audience. Man, where are you from? EWTN. You live here. <laughs> yes, okay. I and live so, here. Uh, you just, yeah, mentioned, you work here actually. just mentioned a minute ago about souls in purgatory. Oh, yes. Uh, what is the connection between adoration and purgatory? There is a connection, absolutely, or I wouldn't be working on this book if there wasn't a connection. But, but in adoration, we, we uh, um, act as mediators, Father, um, for the souls in purgatory, intercessors, um, you know, imploring our Lord, uh, you know, to give them relief through, through adoration. In fact, you know, from the host, that sacred host, Father, streams of alleviating grace flow into purgatory, giving them, giving them relief. So, uh, in fact, Father, uh, if you've been to Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. or in some of the uh, churches in Chicago, mm -hmm. at the base of the altar are reliefs of the souls in purgatory, raising their hands up toward the altar, you know. Um, and sometimes there's altars dedicated to pray for the poor souls in purgatory. I think Saint it's St. Michael's, uh, Saint Michael's Saint exactly, Michael's, you get over it, near yes. North Avenue. Yes, in fact, that was on the cover of one of my books. Uh, and so, so that's the I connection. love that altar. The, the, oh, it's a bond relief yes, of yes. This, the poor souls. Uh, I just love that. Uh, it, it's one of my, my favorite my images. Too. Yeah. Uh, so we act as mediators uh, for the souls in purgatory for adoration. Of course, when you do adoration for the souls in purgatory, you gain an indulgence. Yeah. as well. Okay. Yeah. Let's have another caller. Hello, Annette? Hi, Father Mitch and Susan. Hi. What can we do for you this evening? Well, I have a question. Um, we just have started doing um, the Liturgy of the Hours, and we started that before Lent, and have continued through Lent and Easter, and we're loving it, and we're saying our prayers in front of the Blessed Sacrament the, uh, during Holy Hours. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's fantastic. Oh, uh, I do it every day. <laughs> That's exactly what I do. That's how I start off my holy hour. You know, and so folks understand, the Liturgy of the Hours is a, a, a collection of psalms and readings from Scripture. They're beautiful. Too. And, uh, and in the Roman Rite, it, they also include uh, readings from the, the saints. And it's set up for... 
uh, morning time, there are midday prayers and evening, and then nighttime prayer. And uh, I, I pray the Maronite uh, Liturgy of the Hours. Uh, so, I, so I do Safra in the morning, Ramsho in the evening, and Sotoro at night. And so we, you know, we do that to sanctify the day. That's what the purpose of it is. And doing that before the Blessed Sacrament is wonderful. I, I, I use it to get my holy hour started. I was just going to say, we have in the book seven uh, tips for adoration. We have seven obstacles for adoration, Faustina's insight. But I'm just curious, Father, what, do you, what happens to you during adoration? Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, depends on what I've been up to. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, you know it, it's certainly, um, I, I like to begin uh, with the, the, the Eucharist and then go into the Liturgy of the Hours and the Holy Hours so that, you know, I'm making the Thanksgiving after receiving our Lord as well as uh, saying the Liturgy of the Hours in which I'm praying not only with the whole church, but I'm praying for the church. As a priest, I have a moral obligation to say the office. Uh, we take a vow to do so at ordination uh, to the diaconate. And so I, I make that commitment and I'm interceding for the church uh, in that. And part of it is petition and other parts are the, the Psalms. Uh, but then, you know, I'll, that's where, um, you know, like John Paul, I got the clue from him uh, years ago. That's where I pray over what I write. You know, my Bible studies and yeah. such, that's, yeah. that's a key element. I've done that with, with the books I take. Um, mm -hmm. Father, you, it's funny, but you think you don't have to do anything. You just sit before yeah, him and yeah. I, you get, I get flooded and I have to write, write a lockdown. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What, um, what I really liked too was the, um, the, the part she, when I said she had various intentions that she prayed for, Father, one of the big ones that's very important is she prayed for priests and nuns. Yes. Um, and I just wanted to share this. It. This was very, very powerful. Uh, she said that the, the Lord gave me knowledge of his anger toward mankind, which deserves to have its days shortened because of its sins. But I learned that the world's existence is maintained by chosen souls. That is the religious orders. Woe to the world when there will be a lack of religious orders. And then Jesus goes on, he says to her, in convents too, there are souls that fill my heart with joy. They are a defense for the world before the justice of the heavenly father and a means of obtaining mercy for the world. The love and sacrifice of these souls sustain the world in existence. The Jewish rabbis have a very similar notion that there are holy souls around the world. If they cease to exist, then the world will cease to exist. And in the Maronite community, which is, St. Maron was a hermit. When the, the, uh, there was no hermit, uh, the last hermit had died, and then the Civil War broke out. And it stopped when uh, Abu uh, went back, went out to the hermitage, mm -hmm. the nation's hermitage, mm -hmm. and the, the, the hermits are key. Absolutely we, critical. We, we have one last question. We have just a few seconds left. What's your question? Susan, you mentioned adoration for the homebound. Could you elaborate the, on that, please? Yes, that's what... That's so about, about 30 seconds. 30 seconds, very easy. We have spiritual adoration in the book, meaning if you can't get adoration, we have a special section called spiritual adoration at home with the, you know, what the saints did when they weren't able to go to adoration. We have a special Psalms. We have the Tadam. The whole book can be spiritual adoration, but, but we, that's one thing that you can't find anywhere in any book is it's this. It's parallel to making an act of spiritual communion. Yes, that's in there too. Yeah, yes, yeah, you yes, can make an act yeah, of spiritual, when yeah. you can't receive Holy Communion, make an act of yeah, spiritual yeah. communion and have a spiritual sense. Christ is present. Yes. And you, it's good to be there with the blessed sacrament. I pray right out my window, Father. St. Michael's is out my window. I, I took did spiritual adoration just facing him. Yep. Very yeah. powerful. Yeah. So everyone can do spiritual adoration no matter where you are. Pope Francis was praying 
in the dentist chair I read when he was uh, doing I pray. Pray for the dentist. <laughs> yeah. All right, anyway, but we are out of time, me. flat out of time. I want to thank you thank for you, being thank right. You. Thank you for writing the, oh, these books okay. and for helping us with adoration. And I brought a relic of St. Faustina. I want to bless you all. May the Lord bless you by the intercession of St. Faustina. Bless you with his mercy, especially on this Mercy Sunday, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You know, we can do these shows with Susan and everybody else only because this network is brought to you by you. Mother was inspired to have you do it instead of advertising. So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay our bills too. God bless you and thank you.